Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Happy to have everyone here. Another beautiful morning, and like I always say, it's a beautiful morning. Worship the Lord. Amen. 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 Hey, let's stand up for a minute. So beautiful, such a wonderful day. Let's greet our neighbors.
the Rosedale Buddy Bag Program. They helped us get up and running with our uh, Buddy Bags uh, three, four years ago, whenever it was, and uh, and now they're starting one down there, so that all four of the elementary schools in Park County will be covered. And uh, uh, if you are willing to uh, uh, donate, you can see the note on the back here. Just put uh, put it in the envelope with the word Rosedale Buddy Bags on it. We'll make sure it gets directly there. Okay. Thanks, President. Anybody else? Uh, um, just a second. Let's get that mic to you. Oh, that's very good. I know, but the guy hasn't said that right in here. We're on YouTube now, I think. I was just wondering if anyone was planning on caravanning to uh, Helen Graham's uh, birthday party. If someone wants to talk to me, maybe right. we can set something up and we can all go together. Okay, sounds great. Sounds great. Any other announcements at this time? <laughs> Any birthdays or anniversaries? Thank you.
praised His name. We will praise the Lord, God of us We will sing to His name, for He is gracious. The idols of the world are silver and gold, the work of human hands.
Vanessa, I'd like to have you guys come on up here if you would, please. Oh, I got a bunch of you this morning. That's great. Good to see everybody here this morning. Hey, uh, this is a special morning for Children's Chat. You want to know why? Because this morning it's two for one. We had two children's chats this morning in a row. And uh, in a minute, we're going to open up the Super Summer Surprise Sack and see what Austin brought with him. But first, I'm going to do a little bit of a different children's chat because I want a chance to have a do-over, a children's chat do-over. Okay? Last week, do you get, how many of you were here last week? If you were, you may remember that Micah brought in the Super Summer Surprise Sack, she brought this cute little, yeah, right up there. This cute little, oh, everybody remembers the name, Pinkie Pie, yes. She brought Pinkie Pie with her, and, and I was kind of fumbling around trying to figure out what to do with Pinkie Pie, so I told the story about how long ago when God's people called the Hebrews were trying to get away from the Egyptians who were chasing after them on horses and, you know, horseback and everything, they, they came up to the Red Sea, and God did a miraculous thing. He parted the Red Sea so that the Hebrew people could walk through on dry ground. And then when all the Egyptians on their horses came through, then God closed up the water and all the Egyptians and their horses drowned. <laughs> that was really a really nice story for a cute little <laughs> horse called Pinkie Pie. So after the service, after the worship service, Micah and her mom were coming by and they were, well, they didn't even say hi. They just came up and they said, you know, Pastor Dave, can we just tell you that you kind of blew it with Pinkie Pie? <laughs> I said, oh yeah, why? And they said, well, did you notice the little balloons on Pinkie Pie's backside there? Those are party balloons because Pinkie Pie is the party pony. And so what you should have done instead of killing off Pinkie Pie, <laughs> is tell a story about how Pinkie Pie helps people to celebrate, kind of like God helps us to celebrate. You know, you could tell a story about celebration. So I said, all right, Michael, would you do me a favor? Would you bring Pinkie Pie back next week, and we're going to give Pinkie Pie another chance. We're going to give me another chance. So this is my children's chat do-over, very quickly, okay? And Pinkie Pie, this one is for you, buddy, okay? All right. So, here's... Here's my story, okay? Jesus told a story to some people who were listening to him a long time ago. Jesus told this story about a person who had a hundred sheep. That's a bunch of sheep, huh? That's a bunch of lambs. And he said, now, let's suppose you were the person who had a hundred sheep, and one of them wandered away. Would you just say, oh, fooey on that sheep, he's gone, he's dead, you know? Or would you go out looking after him, looking for him? He said, you'd go looking for him, right? Right. And then when you found him, what would you do? You'd bring him back to the flock. You'd call up all your friends and say, hey, guess what? I found my lamb that was lost, but now he's found. Isn't that great? Come over and celebrate with me. And Jesus said something else. He said, that's what we need to do too, because sometimes people wander away from God, and then... Through the help of God, they come back to God. You know, they wander away. They do things that they're not supposed to do. But they come back to God, and God says, that is a time to celebrate, and we need to celebrate. And so I want us to remember that when people wander away from God and they come back, that's a wonderful time to celebrate. Did I do better, Pinky? Yeah? Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep Pinky up here for a little while, okay? Um... Now, let's see what Austin has in the Super Summer Surprise Act today. Oh boy. Oh boy. You know, we go from Pinkie Pie. Wow. I mean, this is. Alright. Yeah. This is a dragon? The snake. 
When you think about a snake in the Bible, what do you think about? Does anybody know? Yeah. Micah? Adam and Eve, yeah. That when Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, were created by God, God put them in a, in a beautiful garden called Eden. And there were two trees there. One was called the tree of life. And if they ate from the fruit of that, they'd live forever. And the other one was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said to them, if you eat of that tree, if you eat the fruit of that tree, you're going to die. You will. And then along came what? A snake. A snakey snake. Okay. He came along like this. And he said to Eve, he said, hey Eve. That's how we talk, you know. He said, hey Eve. You know, God really wasn't telling you the truth. If you eat that fruit, you're not going to die. What's going to happen is you'll be just like God. You'll know everything. And so Eve thought about it, and she said, Nope, I'm going to obey God, right? No. What did she do? She ate. she ate the fruit. And then Adam's standing there, and he says, Oh, so that's a good fruit, huh? Let me have some. Thump, 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 thump. And the snake goes, <laughs> Because the snake got Adam and Eve to disobey God. They got, the snake got Adam and Eve to not believe God. And then what happened? God came around and said, hey, oh, well, what happened to them? They were afraid because they were naked and so they hid themselves in the bushes. And God came around and said, hey, who told you that you were naked? And they said, well, it's, um, you know, like I said before, it's, uh, it's Eve's fault. You know, Adam said that. And uh, God says, because you disobeyed me, you can't stay in this garden anymore. So I just want you to remember this morning, guys, it's not snakes. Snakes aren't bad, okay? Snakes aren't bad. I mean, snakes are God's creatures, too. But that snake got Adam and Eve to disbelieve and disobey God, you know, to do what God didn't want them to do. It's important for us that we obey God. We read our Bible, we learn what God wants us to do, and we obey it, because that's what's best for us, okay? Do we remember that? You know, the snake is really warm around my neck. Okay. It's a dragon, okay, but it's a snake today. All right. All right, well, anyway, let's, let's pray, you guys. Thank you, God, for both of these stories this morning about about how we can obey you, and about how you help us to celebrate um, when good things happen. Help us to remember that each and every day, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. There you go. Oh, hey, uh, who's going to take the Super Summer Surprise Act? We'll be here next week. You guys have had it. Uh, last week, you know Catherine's going to be here next week. Would you like to help her find something? All right, cool. Very good. You want to go with Tony? Share this morning that we might just uh, just praise God for any joys that you've experienced in the last week or so. Yeah, Robin. Well, it's a joy and a concern. It's a joy because you all prayed for Austin. I'm telling you my testimony. I don't think prayer works. It certainly does because we probably could have planned a funeral after his car accident. Thank you, God, for not, because he will go through the windshield. So he's home and he is recovering. So thank you all. I appreciate it. And listen, if there's any teenagers in here, you wear your seatbelt and quit speeding. <laughs> <laughs> I am on a mission now, so. I'm, I'm with you there. I got to eat the windshield years ago when I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. It's not fun. Other joys that you would like to share? Yes. A little boy fell off the bleachers at Riverton Park's football game last night. He's five years old. And uh, 
They took him to the hospital, and he came home. He slept all night. He's up playing this morning. So God certainly works, doesn't he? Thankful to hear that. And while he was there, they also brought the uh, boy that was injured in the football game. So my daughter was at the hospital, and she said, yeah, they had both of them over there. And the boy from Seeger, who was injured, his father taught at Riverton Park. So they had a double interest down there in the injured. So, but uh, thank the Lord for being with everybody. Um, I was blessed this weekend to spend the weekend with Diane Ayer, and Cindy was there, and we went to Women of Faith in Indianapolis, and it was awesome if you've never met them, ladies. I mean, uh, next year at the same time. Very good. Well, are there other concerns that you would like to share? Yes, Judy. Um, you know, we all take for granted that we can come to church on Sunday morning and praise God. People in Egypt are being killed because they're Christians. Their churches are being burned to the ground. A 14-year-old girl was killed on her way home from school because she had a Bible that means. So I think we just, we need to lift all these Coptic Christians up in our prayers because they really need it. My friend Barb Nelson, is going in to uh, have some procedure tomorrow and she is scared to death. Um, she's had it before and it was a near death experience. So we're going to lift her up, Barb Nelson. She works in the courthouse and with the GED program. Very good. I would like to mention also that we want to continue to remember uh, Carol Milligan's um, uncle and uh, cousin, Ollie and Ricky Nolan. Um, Ollie, or, uh, sorry, Ricky has been moved back from the nursing home now from the uh, hospital. And then there's also a note on your prayer concerns in the bulletin that uh, former member Laura Lehman uh, died August 20th. And so we want to remember her family and friends in our prayers as well. Um, if there are no others, we have a special treat this morning. I'd like to invite us to prepare our hearts and minds for prayer as we... Uh, Listen to the music of the farmer's daughters.
holy, holy are you, Lord. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. And you have called us to be as you are, holy and set apart for your purposes. We thank you this morning for the privilege that we have of being yours, your children, your partners in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we can't come to you this morning with those words of holiness echoing in our minds without remembering that there are so many times when we fall short of all that you have designed for us. And in doing so, we not only hurt ourselves, but we keep others from seeing you in us. Forgive us, we pray, for those times that we do fall short. And thank you for the gift of your Son, whose life, death, and resurrection made possible forgiveness for us. God, we thank you also that you are a God who cares about each and every concern that we have, every joy that we've shared this morning. And we want to thank you for those joys, for all the ways in which you have surprised us and blessed us. But we also want to lift up to you those that we have mentioned who are on our hearts, who are struggling with illness and infirmity of body, or sickness of spirit or of mind. Lord, there are others who are battling so many different problems, and there are so many of them that we simply pause for another moment to, to lift them before you in the quiet of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers that we offer in the name of Christ as we offer back to you the prayer that he taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
First reading this morning is from Psalm 103, and uh, this will be from the New Revised Standard Version. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we are made, and he remembers that we are dust. Now would you please stand as you are able for the Gospel reading, which is from Luke chapter 15, and I'll be reading from the message paraphrase. Well, by this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and religion scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled, he takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. And their grumbling triggered this story. There was once a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined and careless, he wasted everything he had. After he had gone through all his money, there was a bad famine all throughout that country, and he began to hurt. He signed on with a citizen there who assigned him to his fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry, he would have gladly eaten the corn cobs in the pig slop, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses, and he said, All those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am, starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. Then he got right up and went home to his father. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him, his heart pounding. He ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. His son started his speech, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I don't deserve to be your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He called to the servants, Quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and is now alive. He was given up for lost and he's now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. All this time, his older son was out in the field. When the day's work was done, he came in. As he approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. Calling over one of the houseboys, he asked what was going on. He told him, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast, barbecued beef, because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stalked off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, look, how many years 
Have I stayed here serving you, never giving you one moment of grief, but have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? And then this son of yours who's thrown away your money on whores shows up, and you go all out with a feast. His father said, Son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time, and everything that is mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time, and we had to celebrate. Because this brother of yours was dead, and he's alive. He was lost. And now he's found. May the Lord add his blessing to the hearing and the reading of his word. Amen. You can leave a seat. Well, I had to laugh last Sunday when, after the service, uh, Micah and her mom um, informed me that I had really missed the point with Pinkie Pie. Um, you know, like I said in the children's chat, I, I totally missed that opportunity to, to talk about how Pinkie Pie is like God and helps us to celebrate the wonderful things of God. I, you know, I, I went and killed off Pinkie Pie. And so, so not only do I want to have another chance um, with the children's chat, but I, I kind of wanted to have Pinkie Pie up here sort of sponsor this message. I, I, I found myself thinking after I had that conversation with Micah and Joanne, um, how I, I kind of felt badly about it. I, in fact, I felt like one of my daughter's favorite uh, fluffy stuffed animals, um, Grumpy Bear, the Care Bear. <laughs> And you know, Care Bear is, uh, I mean, Grumpy Bear is, is one who, like I sort of rained on Pinkie Pie's parade, you know, he's always raining on people's parades, because he just can't see the good in things, you know, he's always seeing the negative, that's why he has that little rain cloud, but he also has a good heart, that's why the hearts are there too. Anyway, I got to thinking this week, I just haven't been able to let go of that conversation that I had with them, and I got to thinking how much... Grumpy Bear here reminds me not only of me at times, but also of the elder brother in the story that we just heard from the gospel. You remember that elder brother? He's the one who, he was the good boy. He was the good kid who stayed home and did everything that his father expected of him. And yet, when his brother, who had gone out and splurged and wasted family inheritance and dragged the family name through the mud and, and made a mess of his own life, when he came back, the father threw this big party for him. And that son refused to go to the party. Now, I want to suggest to you this morning that I think that story that we usually call the this, this parable of the prodigal son is just as much about the elder brother as it is about the younger one, if not more so. And I say that because if you look at the beginning of Luke chapter 15, you see that the audience that Jesus was talking with at that time was a group of religious professionals of his day. The Bible calls them scribes and Pharisees. They were people who strictly observed the law, the Jewish law. And they expected others to do likewise. And Jesus compared them to this elder brother who was kind of the party pooper of his father's big celebration. He compared the scribes and Pharisees to the elder brother because they were constantly criticizing Jesus for hanging out with all the people that they considered to be not worthy of Jesus' time, and certainly not worthy of God's love. And so Jesus told that story to them. And as I've been spending time this week just meditating on that scripture, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about it, and, and I have to tell you, it's kind of painful for me to do that, because, because, my story parallels the 
elder brother's story so closely. And because of that, I want to take just a moment for us to revisit that story and to look not so much at the younger son as the older brother. And I want to, I want to share with you what, what I tend to call elder brother syndrome. Because I see it a lot in the church. Elder brother syndrome, let me tell you what that looks like to me. I want to tell you what it looks like, uh, how it acts, what we can do about it, and best of all, I want, to, I want to talk about what can happen when elder brother syndrome is confronted face to face by the amazing grace of God. Elder brother syndrome is marked by a couple of things. One is it's marked by a desire uh, and, a, and a passion for, for doing more and more good stuff. I mean, these are elder brothers. I count myself among them. Elder brothers, and you can say elder sisters too if you want to use that. We're people who try to do the right things. But, as we found out in the story of that Jesus told, the motivation there is trying to earn God's favor. Elder brothers like me, or certainly like I have been many times in my life, elder brothers like me are always trying to do more so that we can get God to look favorably upon us. Maybe even go so far as to say to get God to love us. But folks, I'm here to tell you that that just flies in the face of what the Bible tells us God is all about. Because we have a God who, even in the Old Testament people, a God who loves us unconditionally. God gave us the laws, the commandments, and all of that out of love to help guide us, to help protect us, to help us live an abundant life. But God never said, you do this and I will love you. God loves us already. And yet elder brothers are constantly worried about, have I done enough? Have, oh, that have I measured up to, to what God wants so that, so that God will look favorably on me? And there's always this nagging doubt. And because of that, the interesting thing that the elder brother does, which so many of us elder brothers do, is when he can't feel good about how he measures up to God, he starts comparing himself to others, especially to his younger brother. And he says to his dad, Dad, okay, look, look at me, look at my younger brother. Huh? Huh? I love a song that Stephen Curtis Chapman recorded years ago that was entitled, You Know Better. And the words of the first verse go like this. I saw you staring out the window, watching the people passing by, taking some notes on what you saw out there so you would know how hard you need to try. I heard you asking lots of questions, how in comparison you stand. Please let me warn you to be very careful. God wants our best and not our better than. And then the chorus goes on to say, but you know better than that. God's standard of holiness, as you sang so beautifully in your song, God's standard of holiness is perfection. And the fact of the matter is, folks, we will never measure up to God's perfection. Not on our own. If there's one thing that is true, Paul says this in Romans chapter 7, there's one thing about the law, the commandments, it stands there as a way of measuring how we measure up. And folks, when we look at that, we don't measure up so good. In fact, we can never measure up. And Paul says it's only by accepting for ourselves what Christ has done for us through his life, death, and resurrection that we can be counted 
worthy. Paul says, we don't live by the law. We don't, we don't measure up to God's standard just by following the letter of the law. We measure up by faith. We accept by faith that we are loved. We accept that in the Spirit. That's what's going on with elder brother syndrome. Realizing that we can't measure up to this holy God, and so we start focusing on others and comparing ourselves to them. And God says, stop it. So how do we stop that? I'd like to suggest to you that the first and best way is to focus right here. To see the kind of love that God showed for us in taking on human flesh and giving his own life for us to say, this is how much I love you. Are you willing to accept this for yourself by faith? I'd also like to suggest to you that one of the other ways that we can begin to uh, deal with this elder brother syndrome, because, you know, sometimes those of us who are elder brothers, we're the good, good kids, good Christians, we want to think of ourselves that way. We look at people who have been out there and doing all the kinds of stuff like the younger brother did, and we think, you know, again, I haven't done that kind of stuff. Let me tell you something. When some of those younger brothers come to Christ, there's powerful testimony there. Because they don't, they aren't trying to pretend like there's something that they're not. They know that they are saved by grace through faith. Period. And you know, some of the, it took me a long, long time. Because for a long time as a, as a, a youth and a young adult, I tried to compare myself to other people, and I was always doing that. But when I finally came to accept the, the love and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ for myself, I realized that, you know, those folks who have gone a different path than me, who have lived on the wild side and then come back, they have some wonderful things to teach me. And it's time for me to listen to their stories and to listen how God has worked in their lives and to accept them, to reach out to them as, as brothers and sisters. <coughs> what happens? What happens when a church <coughs> begins to realize that all of us, younger brothers, older brothers, figuratively speaking, all of us need the salvation that's made possible in Jesus Christ? We start accepting one another as brothers and sisters in Christ instead of comparing ourselves to one another. And when that happens, incredible ministry can happen. I want to share with you a story to close here. It's a little bit long, but it's written by a man named Tony Campolo. I don't know how many of you, many of you are familiar with Tony Campolo? A few of you have heard the name. He was a professor at Eastern University in uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, he was out in Hawaii one day, uh, actually for an extended period of time for a conference. And he tells about an incident that happened while he was there in Honolulu. He was, uh, he was having a hard time sleeping in the middle of the night. So I'm going to read this the way he wrote it. I've condensed it a little bit. Up a side street, I found a little place that was still open. I went in, took a seat on one of the stools at the counter, and waited to be served. This was one of those sleazy places that deserves the name Greasy Spoon. But it was the only place I could find. When the big burly guy behind the counter came over and asked me what I wanted, I told him I wanted a cup of coffee and a donut. As I sat there munching on my donut and sipping my coffee at 3.30 in the morning, the door of the diner suddenly swung open, and to my discomfort, in marched eight or nine provocative and boisterous prostitutes. It was a small place, and they sat on either side of me. Their talk was loud and crude. I felt completely out of place and was just about to make my getaway when I overheard the woman beside me say, You know, tomorrow's my birthday. I'm going to be 39. 
Her friend responded in a nasty tone, So what do you want from me? A birthday party? You want me to get you a cake and sing happy birthday? Come on, said the woman sitting next to me. Why do you have to be so mean? I was just telling you, that's all. I don't want anything from you. I mean, why should you give me a birthday party? I've never had a birthday party in my whole life. Why should I have one now? When I heard that, I made a decision. I sat and waited until the women had left. Then I called over the big guy behind the counter, his name was Harry, and I asked him, do they come here every night, including that one who was sitting right beside me? Yeah, he answered, that's Agnes. She comes in here every night. Why, what do you want to know? Well, because I heard her say that tomorrow's his birthday, her birthday, I told him. What do you think about you and me throwing a birthday party for her right here tomorrow night? A cute little smile crossed his chubby cheeks and he answered with delight, That's a great idea! I like it! That is a great idea! All right, look, I said, if it's okay with you, I'll come back here tomorrow morning about 2.30 and decorate the place. I'll even get a birthday cake. Oh, no way, said Harry. The birthday cake's my thing. I'll make the cake. <laughs> so at 2.30 the next morning, I was back at the diner. I had picked up some crepe paper decorations at the store and had made a sign out of big pieces of cardboard that read, Happy Birthday, Agnes! I had that diner looking good. <laughs> Well, word must have gone out on the street somehow, because at 3.15, about every prostitute in Honolulu came flooding in that diner. <laughs> then at 3.30 on the dot, the door of the diner swung open again, and in came Agnes and her friend. I had everybody ready ahead of time. And when they came in, we all screamed, Happy Birthday, Agnes! Never have I seen a person so flabbergasted and so shaken. Her mouth fell open, her legs buckled a bit, and as she was led to one of the stools at the counter, we all sang happy birthday to Agnes. Her eyes moistened, and when the birthday cake with all the candles on it was carried out, she just lost it and cried openly. Harry grumbled. Yo, Agnes, blow out the candles and cut the cake. We all want some cake, Agnes. Agnes looked down at the cake. Then, without taking her eyes off of it, she slowly and softly said, um, Look, is it okay if, um, I, I mean, is it all right if, if we don't eat it right away? Harry shrugged and said, Sure, it's your party. <laughs> You want to keep the cake, keep the cake. You can take it home if you want. Can I, she asked. Then she got up off the stool, picked up the cake, and carrying it like it was the Holy Grail, walked slowly toward the door and left. When the door closed, there was a stunned silence in the place. Not knowing what else to do, I broke the silence by saying, what do you say we pray? So I prayed for Agnes and for her salvation. I prayed that her life would be changed and that God would be good to her. When I finished, Harry leaned over the counter and with a trace of hostility in his voice, he said, Hey, you never told me you was a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to anyway? In one of those moments when just the right words came, I answered, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for whores at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> Harry waited a moment and then sneered, oh, No, you don't. <laughs> there ain't no church like that. If there was, I'd join it. I'd join a church like that. And then Campolo closes his story by saying, wouldn't we all? I want to leave you with that question this morning. Would we all? I hope and I pray that the 
answer to that question here is yes. You see, because there is hope in that kind of church. There is hope for transformation, and in fact, there is transformation that takes place in that kind of church. There's honesty in that kind of church. There is forgiveness in that kind of church. And friends, what I want to tell you is that's exactly the kind of church that Jesus came to create. That's why he came. And that's why we do things like this. And yes, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward. We don't do this to buy God's favor. We do this to say thank you for loving us right where we are. Let this offering of thanks be exactly that. We're going to close the service in a moment by singing Amazing Grace, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. But first, let us offer to God our offerings of thanks. <laughs> speaking to your heart this morning, saying, come home. Maybe you're the younger brother who's wandered away and done things that you know very well God does not approve of. God's saying, come home. Come home. I've made the way for you to come home. Or maybe you're the elder brother, and you've been so proud thinking to yourself, you know, I'm, I'm living a good life. God says, you come home. Because you're trying so hard to earn my love, and I'm standing here, arms wide open, saying, I love you before you do any of that.
come on home. Just let me love you. Or maybe you want to come up here and just pray for somebody else that you know needs to come home. The altar is open. Just respond to the Lord's leading and let's sing together.